All righty. Well, good morning. This morning we are going to look at uh, what chapter are we in? I think this is chapter 16 of Good Works. And we are going to look at paragraph two. Now, we're only going to look at a small portion of paragraph two today. And, uh, and instead of printing that out and then giving it to you and then not having it next week, uh, I put the portion that we're going to look at up here this morning. All right? Um, so let me read this for us. Uh, and we're, I'm just going to read this first part, and then we'll pick up the rest of it next week. All right? It says, These good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruit and evidence of a true and lively faith. Now let's pray. Father, we ask your grace to be upon us this morning as we study from this confession. Father, teach us what it is to be those who do good works in obedience to you. Teach us what it is to be those who have a true and lively faith. May our lives be marked by the evidences of good works. Lord, we pray this for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I want to start off with, with good works in obedience to God's commands, right? And when we think of obedience to God's commands, what do we generally think of? The commandments. The law. The law, right? The Ten Commandments, right? So here we have Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. This is the second giving of the law. It says, Oh, that they had a heart as always as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments that it might go well with them and with their descendants. So here, in the context of giving of the Ten Commandments, not in Exodus, but in Deuteronomy, Moses highlights the significance of fearing God and keeping his commandments for the well-being of the people and their descendants. Proverbs 3, 12. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Here in the book of Proverbs, we see that it's often emphasized that we are to be those who understand the benefits of wisdom, and wisdom is identified as obeying God's commands, and this will bring about a long and peaceful life. And then we have Psalm 119.46, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my eyes may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then... I will not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. All right? So Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the whole Bible, and it's a comprehensive meditation on the beauty and importance of God's word and commands. Right? So here, this small excerpt, these two verses, three verses, highlights the desire to keep God's commandments diligently. Right? So when we think about God's commands, we think of the law, we think of the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament was the time when God's people had to keep the law. And I think that this is a complete misunderstanding of the Bible, right? So Dan taught on Psalm 15, and, uh, and so I didn't have to teach on Psalm 15, so I wasn't diligently uh, preparing for this, uh, but this is probably too much information. But now that I'm not teaching on Wednesdays, I like to take a shower before church on Wednesdays. Uh, so that way I don't have to take a shower afterwards. I like to take my showers at night generally, right? So Dan was teaching that night, and I was like, I'm going to listen to someone teach on Psalm 15 and hear what they have to say, and I'll get to hear what Dan has to say. And I, I thought this would be a good, a good thing, right? And, uh, and I won't mention, I don't remember the guy's name, but if I did, if I, did I won't mention it. I don't want to, to shame him because of my disagreement here with him. Um, but... Um, but I think he, he grossly misunderstood Psalm 15, and the and the challenge that I had is he kept kind of he kept kind of saying things that were sort of against what he was making the argument for, right? So his his argument was, and so remember Psalm 15. Uh, so this is what Dan taught on. He says, "Oh, who will who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill?" Right, and then. Uh, David, is the psalmist I did today here, gives out a list of the qualities of the individual who would be able to be present with God, right? And he said that according to the Old Testament perspective, you had blessings and curses, 
and those were connected to obedience and disobedience, right? And I, I don't disagree with that. We see that in, in Deuteronomy, right? So here, the one who has access to God, who can walk with God, are those who walk rightly, those who live their lives in the right manner. So he said this is the old covenant perspective. And now under the new, connect, new covenant perspective, no longer is our blessing and curses connected to obedience and disobedience. They're on the basis of the finished work of Christ, right? And so now it's not whether or not we live rightly, but it's based on whether we have faith, right? And so he created this dichotomy that under the old covenant, you had to live right, do the right thing, and then God blesses you and you can dwell with God. But under the new covenant, we come into this radically new dispensation that now all that matters is, is faith, right? And what I think we see here is a, a, an improper reading of the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Now, what do I mean by that, right? Should we read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament? In some ways, that's beneficial. We'll see, I think, ways in, in which that is tremendously beneficial when we look at Leviticus 23 today, right? But one of the issues is that when we think of the law through the lens of the New Testament, we are understanding the law by its misappropriation, by how it's misapplied. We interpret the Old Covenant law in the same way that the Pharisees interpreted the Old Covenant law. That's often what time, what we do. I think one of the things that's been uh, difficult and damaging to our interpretation and understanding of the Old Testament is, is the rise of dispensationalism, right? When we think of dispensationalism, we usually think of it in eschatological terms. So in eschatological terms, there's going to be a millennial kingdom, there's going to be a time of tribulation, all these sorts of things. But dispensationalism creates a huge chasm between the Old and the New Covenants. And I don't think that we should have this huge chasm. I don't think what we're supposed to see here is that in the Old Covenant, if you want to follow God or be a, be, have fellowship with God, you obey His commands. And in the New Covenant, if you want to have fellowship with God, you have faith. And we create this dichotomy, right? So the way he put this is he said, in the Old Covenant, a righteous walk was the condition for fellowship, and under the New Covenant, a righteous walk is the result of fellowship. And I don't think that's helpful. Because when we look at the New Testament, this is what we see in John 14, 15. Jesus speaking. If you love me, you will keep my what? Commandments. commandments. Right? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this verse underscores the connection between love for Christ and obedience to his commandments. Good works as an expression of love and faith are evidence of obedience to God's commandments. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this passage highlights that believers are created for good works, and these are a part of God's plan for our lives. Obedience to God's commands is a response to his divine design for, the, for those who have their lives in Christ, right? 1 John 5, 3, for the love of God is this, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So here the Apostle John emphasizes that keeping God's commandments is an expression for, of love for God. Obedience is not a burden, but a natural response to love and gratitude. And then James, James probably hits on this harder than anyone, James 2, 17 through 18. So also, faith, faith by itself, if it is not, sorry, so faith, if by, so it, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So here, James shows the, the inseparable relationship between faith and works. Obedience to God's command is the natural overflow of genuine faith. And good works serve as a visible manifestation of that faith. So I don't think that we see a dichotomy between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. 
The old covenant's focus was that you love God, and as, a, as because you love God and because you put your faith and hope and trust in him, because God has redeemed you from, from slavery, has redeemed you from exodus, he has brought you into the promised land, because this God who has been so gracious to you, now in faith you obey the commandments. And you can demonstrate and know who has faith because they kept the commandments. That's why when you look at Hebrews 11, what do we call that chapter? It's not the name of the chapter that the author of Hebrews gave to it, but what do we call chapter 11? The hall of faith, right? We don't call it the hall of those who are self-righteous and earned their way to heaven. We call it the hall of faith because these old covenant peoples had faith in the same way that we do. The only difference is, is that their faith was anticipatory. Their faith was looking to God's deliverance, right? As you get further along in the text, then there's hints in the Old Covenant, right? There's going to be someone like Moses. There's going to be someone who'll come and crush the serpent's head. Eventually you get into the Davidic era. There's going to become a king. So as scripture unfolds, we get a better and better and better picture of who this messianic figure who's going to come. So in the Old Testament, they're looking forward in some sort of anticipation of someone or somehow God's going to bring salvation to the people. And they have faith that God will bring that. In the New Covenant, we simply look back. We now have a vision of that person. And that's largely what we'll look at in this morning's sermon. But faith is the source of salvation for all. It is not that the Old Covenant people earned their salvation through good works. Uh, as this person put it, righteous walk was the condition for fellowship. The righteous walk is no more the condition of fellowship for Old Covenant believers as it is for us. And he said in the New Covenant, a righteous walk is the result of fellowship. The righteous walk of, of us in the New Covenant is no more the result of faith than it is for them. So I, don't, I just want to make sure we understand that there's not this huge dichotomy between them. It's only in what we are anticipating or what we're looking back on. Now, the next section says, so these good works done in obedience to God's commands are the fruit and evidence of a true and lively faith. So I just want to talk about what it means that faith is true and lively. Right? This is probably the, the hardest thing. I don't know how to communicate this. Right? Uh, I don't know really how to express this. Um, and so I'm going to do my best. Um, and so they always say if there is a mist in the pulpit, there will be an absolute fog in the congregation. Right? And this is mist for me. And so I, I suspect likely that there will be fog for you. Right? Um, that I probably won't make much sense. And, uh, and so if, the, if what I say is absolute fog to you, if it's an absolute blizzard and you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, let me know and maybe through a long conversation uh, of, of a back and forth, we can sort of try to, to unveil this, all right? Now, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says this just monumental thing. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. All right? What does it mean when he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live in this body that we have, I live by faith in the Son of God. All right? So here, Paul is articulating the transformative impact that happens through union with Christ, right? So the reason that people get married is so we can see what union looks like. Husband and wife get married, they're made into one flesh, right? All of that is done so that we might have a picture of the union that Christ people have with him, so that we become one with him, right? We are united to Christ. Now, through our identifying with Christ and his identifying with us, we are so bound to him in holy union that we become co-crucified with Christ in his crucifixion. Meaning that the old self is dead and the former way of life characterized by sin and separation from God is over. Right? So today when we take the Lord's Supper together, Right? And we remember what Christ accomplished on that cross. 
in this, in this mystical union that we have with him, we are co-crucified. You, you were there on the cross. You yourself was crucified, if you're in Christ, and you died. The old man died. Right? That's what Paul is saying. So that old way of life, that former life, characterized by sin and separation from God, that man has been put to death. That woman has been killed. Right? Then he says the statement, okay, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This emphasizes the radical transformation that takes place when we are born again by the Spirit of God. Right? We are given a, a radical new birth. We are not what we were. We are new creations. Right? So there is this radical thing that takes place when we are born again by the Spirit of God. And through this spiritual rebirth, the old self is replaced by the indwelling presence of Christ. That becomes the source and center of who we are. And that indwelling presence of Christ is the Spirit of Christ. Right? So the Holy Spirit, now, for the new believers, so this is an area where we are different from our old covenant believers, right? but it comes, and so His Spirit becomes our life. So that's why Paul can say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, right? So now we have this. No longer are we dead and cold and we have stone hearts, but we have, been, have hearts that have been brought to life. This was an aspect of that new covenant hope, Ezekiel 36, 26. And I will give you a, a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will move the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, right? So we are, we are radically different, right? It's not that we're just slightly different. It's not just that we have different thoughts or different motives, but we are, are new in this radical new way, right? We have been born again. The believer, now alive in Christ, lives with a conscious dependence on him so that, as Paul says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So now, every aspect of what we do is dependent on Him. And that's why, uh, and, and again, I, I don't think I'm necessarily communicating this very well. I, I just don't know how to communicate this very well. Right? But that's why when we went through, a couple summers ago, we went through the spiritual disciplines. Right? Read your Bible regularly. Meditate on the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. Pray. Worship. Serve. Do these things. Right? And I said, it's not that if you do these things, you will get better, right? This, this is a season, been a fun season for me. Uh, I'm getting to live vicariously through my son, Jed, uh, as Jed's playing basketball, and I loved basketball as a kid, right? And, and I have different things that Jed does, and he practices them every day, right? And so every day, he has to take at least 20, make 20 made layups on the right side and 20 made up layups on the left side. And lo and behold, in his last game, he made a layup, Right? And that's because you practice these over and over and over and it gets better. But the spiritual disciplines are not like this, right? The spiritual disciplines are not, I read my Bible every day, I get, I get more holy. I pray every day, I get more holy. I, I worship, I get more holy. I serve people, I get more holy. It's not like that, right? And the reason is, is because we can do those things without faith, and they have no benefit to us. It is only when we read the Word of God with faith that it brings to us spiritual growth. It's only when we pray in faith that we get spiritual growth. It's when we come to God and we recognize who God is, what He's accomplished for us through Christ, and we receive that as being a benefit given to us through the Holy Spirit so that we are completely dependent on Him that these things begin to have benefit. And so faith is the outworking experience of that new life and is an expression of our union with Christ. And that's why, not necessarily in this congregation, I think it's different in the West, but if we go to the Southeast, you can find people who have been in a church pew every Sunday for the last 50 years, and they will be some of the most godless people you've ever seen. They may have moral lives, but there's no love for Christ, there's no excitement for the gospel, there's no compassion, right? And that's because they have not participated in the worship of the congregation in faith. 
They are just doing it as, as mere legalism, right? And so in the same way that the Pharisees completely misunderstood the Old Testament and thought it was about works righteousness, so in the New Covenant we can do the same thing. As we experience Jesus' love as the one who loved me and gave himself for me, as Paul says, transformation takes place so that the nature of Christ's character becomes ours. We are begin being transformed into his likeness, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Right? So as we live our lives in faith, beholding the glory and majesty of Christ, we ourselves are experiencing that glorification. Right? We, are, we are experiencing that transformation in sanctification. We are becoming more and more like Him. The new life of the Christian is experienced as love, uh, as love is lived out by faith, working through love. Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Our love is an example of Christ's love. John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Right? So here, ourselves have been, have been crucified, our old selves have been crucified, and now the life that is in us, if we are in Christ, is the life of Christ. So this is why the author of Hebrews says this. Chapter 10, uh, verses 35 through 39. He says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Here he's speaking to Jews who professed faith in Christ, but are now tempted to go back to Judaism because of the hardships they're enduring. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For, now he's quoting here, yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere, they're preserved their souls. Right? So he says here, but my righteous one shall live by faith. Right? The life we live, we live by faith. The author of Hebrew is calling these Jewish Christians to persevere, and the means of their perseverance is faith. My righteous one shall live by faith. Right? And it's contrasted with those who shrink back and are destroyed. Right? But we are not like them because we are those who have faith. And here he quotes from Habakkuk 2 4, which says, Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not right within him. Right? So here he's speaking about the arrogant. He's saying his soul is not right. He's puffed up. And this is contrasted with, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Right? So it is through faith that we have these things. The parallel is between one who is puffed up and self-reliant and the one who lives by dependence on God. Living by faith is the defining characteristic of the believer under the covenant of grace. Which the significant, with the significant difference being under the dispensation of the new covenant, we receive the life of the Son of God by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Right? So I just don't want us to see here, when we see this expectation of keeping God's commands, for us to think, oh, that's old covenant. New covenant, we just have faith. No. Under the dispensation of the covenant of grace, from when Adam fell till Jesus returns, we have always been those who have been called to faith, and faith is the outworking of that true faith, right? And we are out of time, all right? Um, and so we will pick up part C of the first part, um, the fruits and evidence of a true and lively faith. So that was what we are supposed to finish on, um, but I carried on too long there. Um,
But I, I just want to stress the importance. Faith is not simply a, a mental ascent. Faith is a, a union with Christ so that our whole lives are a dependence on him and we live not by our own strength, not by our own might, but we live through the strength that he provides independence, independence on him. All right. Cloudy as a blizzard. I hear you talking, but there's this fog out here. It is, I know. <laughs> if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the in the, in the crowd, and uh, and uh, yeah. So so if this just doesn't make sense to you, come talk to me. We'll find time to talk, and maybe through through dialogue, we can unveil these things. Um, let us pray, Father. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Lord, we ask that your blessing be upon us. Give us the grace to to be those who, in faith, now. In this next hour, worship you. May we be those who, who recognize your supremacy and your glory and your beauty and your excellency, and so that our heart turns to you in greatest affections. May we also see you as the one who is terrible, who is mighty, who is uh, dangerous, and let it not cause our hearts to wander away in fear, but let that fear turn into an amazing awe. And may we come to you to delight in how glorious you are. A glory so magnificent that it causes the earth to shudder and quake. Lord, fill our hearts with delight in you. Lord, we pray that you would do this by your spirit and through your word. Grant us the grace in, in communion with one another to worship and glorify you. May your son be honored in all of our words and deeds. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.